everybody. My name is Captain Bill. I'm uh, 24 years old. I'm from Long Island, New York. Uh, right now I'm sailing down the, uh, the east coast of the United States. I'm going from New York down to the Florida Keys or the Bahamas, somewhere where it's nice and warm. It's a super rainy, windy morning this morning. We're on the dock, the free dock in Monio, North Carolina, Roanoke Island. And we have some neighbors, some fellow sea wind owners, Godspeed over there. We're gonna get off the dock here soon. Over the next day or two, we're gonna tell you a little bit of a story about kind of how we started this whole thing, how I started this whole thing. When I left Long Island by myself 10 years ago, pretty much almost exactly 10 years ago, when I did that trip, it was similar time of the season and honestly similar weather, rainy, windy, cold the whole way down. But first, before we continue on with that, let's get off the dock, get out there into the windy, oh, no. wet weather. So about 11 years ago, after college, I was getting my foot in the door as a teacher. I was working as an aide in like a behavioral and special ed school and taking some prereqs at a community college to, to get my teaching cer certification, but I needed a few more prereqs. And it was a good stepping stone to get into teaching on Long Island, which is a really good job on Long Island. And a lot of the guys I lifeguarded with uh, were teachers. So they got to teach all school year, and then in the summer they got to lifeguard, and that was kind of the dream. But I really wanted to get away from Long Island in the winters and adventure, and honestly go sailing. And I wasn't a sailor really at the time. I, I kiteboarded and I sailed little boats here and there. Um, but I started reading about sailing and cruising and some of these books that talk like Lynn and Larry Part E books and then some other books that kind of told you what was a good cruising boat. Wait, so why, where did that dream of you just want to sail away came in? Because nobody you knew did that. Yeah, like no one in my family, I mean I guess my uncle was kind of a sailor but not, not like a full time or long term cruiser. Um, but that was later in life anyway, so I, I don't really know where it started. I guess in college I followed Liz Clark um, in The Voyage of Swell, and she was a surfer and a Patagonia ambassador, and somehow I started following her blog. She sailed, like, left, fixed up this old boat, left California, sailed to French Polynesia, kind of just lived aboard and surfed. I thought that was the coolest lifestyle ever, and I guess that's, like, one of the beginning, you know, ideas of, of cruising and living aboard full-time. So while I was doing this stuff, I kind of had this dream of, you know, just feeling out, you know, maybe getting a sailboat and going cruising and just exploring that idea just a little bit. I mean, it wasn't a real thing at the time. But as time went on, like, I learned more about it, and, and I learned more about what made a good cruising sailboat. And I was kind of handy. I fixed up old, like, Boston Whalers and stuff that my dad had behind the garage when, when we were a kid. So I could do some fiberglass work and sanding and paint and stuff like that. So I worked on Fire Island for lifeguarding, and sometimes I'd take my little Boston Whaler to work, but a lot of times we would take the ferry to work. Where we parked for the ferry, right across the canal, there was a boat yard. And eventually I spotted this sailboat in the boat yard, and it looked like what these books were talking about it it was a double ender it had a you know a canoe stern and this full keel and it just looked like and what I've seen in in these books and the pictures in these books at the beginning of the lifeguard season I didn't really have any money because being an aide at this school really did not pay well at all it was strictly just a, a stepping stone and I went over to that boat yard and I asked what the deal is with this boat. And they're like, ah, oh, yeah, some guy kind of left it here years ago. And we definitely just want to get rid of it. So, like, you know, make an offer and maybe you could have it. I didn't even have any money to make an offer with at the time. And I was getting into lifeguard season, so it was getting busy. I worked almost every day. Uh, 33 knots. 34 knots. 35 knots. 36 knots. Holy smokes. <laughs> 
Look how shallow it is right next to us, just outside the channel. We're in our last little channel here that we got to stay in. Tight little channel before the bay opens up. So we're going to lose the shelter of all the spoil islands and shallow water and everything. It's going to get a little bumpy for a while, but we'll be able to not be so concerned about getting outside the channel. It'll be a deep open bay, so we can kind of, we'll probably jive that way first and then do another jive to the to starboard towards our next anchorage. But this last one, we're going like dead downwind with just the main up right now. It's a little bit sketchy. We really don't want to accidentally jive when we're not prepared. So it's kind of a balance of like staying in this tight channel and not going too far where we accidentally jive. So far so good. We're almost to the end. We got a triple reef in the main. No jib out right now, but we will probably pull a bit of jib out in a little bit when we have a little bit of an angle. Putting the boat to the test. <laughs> so how do we know when we're like too overpowered? Uh, like we have as little sail out as possible. How do we know when we need to take it all down? <laughs> I don't like that answer. Your chart? What does your chart say? How fast? 11 one. Nice. I might take back this statement eventually, but I think my favorite direction of sail is like a downwind. It's still so calm, like we're riding waves. But it's not like hitting us on the side where it's like making it uncomfortable in any way. It's just like we're a little surf in these little waves. Even though it's crazy windy. We got pretty steady 30 knots of wind still down to 25. It's basically between 25 and 35 knots. And we're going like, I don't know, anywhere from seven and a half to 12 knots. So it definitely got a bit rougher out since we're out of the lee of all the spoil islands and shallow water. Nice little waves and we're surfing down these little waves at up to 12 knots, between 10 and 12 knots on the surf, which is pretty cool. These are my, some of my favorite conditions to be sailing in. It's not too crazy because we're in a bay still. Average has been like eight knots probably. Very, like a, an average average is eight knots. Funny thing about catamarans, you know, they're known to be fast, right, in general. Even though you can have fast, high speeds, like even though we're surfing at 10 to 12 knots and we're doing like, we're seeing eight knots all day long, we are dipping down to seven, seven and a half knots a lot. This is something we noticed on adrenaline as well. It's hard to maintain high averages. Like to, to maintain a 10 knot average, you gotta be doing mid to high teens pretty consistently. And that's compared to like monoholes. Like I feel like monoholes are a little bit heavier, a little more consistent in their speed. So it's a little easier to maintain um, the average of the numbers you're seeing. Where again, as a, as a catamaran, you've got to be sailing pretty fast to maintain relatively high averages. I saw a 14.6. I saw a 14.5. Is it 14.6? Is that the official top speed so far? I saw it right here. All right, keep an eye on that top speed. Thirteen three. <laughs> Hear that hum? That's the sound of speed records wanting to be broken. <laughs> You missed that hum from the Corsair 880? <laughs> that was a purr. This is a hum. In case you had a doubt, <laughs> it's very windy! <laughs> and I think I have a new favorite seat on the boat. We're in the lee of 
this shore and we're only three miles out from our anchorage. We got here pretty early because we averaged over eight knots. We averaged like 8.3 8 knots. Three miles away, so we're gonna start to, in a couple miles, we'll start to get the jib in, the motor into the wind, get the main down, and get up into our anchorage, which is just some little bay off, off the Pamlico Sound here. I think we're in a pretty remote area, nothing around. And because we're in the lee, it got a lot calmer. So we had some exciting surfs and sail, and yeah, now it's settling down, and it's getting to be a little bit more of a flat ride, last three miles. So, almost there. We keep going because we are just booking it, but this is like the last anchorage before we have to like go double the distance and it gets dark so early now. And last night we got in pretty late and there was just crab pods everywhere and it's super sketchy. So I'm calling her early so we don't have to worry about that. My gosh, guys, what a difference a day can make. It is sunny, it is so much warmer, and it is calm, but we still have enough wind to sail. But I guess we're not gonna be going as fast as yesterday, which means we're not gonna get there as fast. But it'll be a smoother ride today, I think. Do you think? Yeah, it's gonna be so nice today. <laughs> Dipping below four, getting to like three and a half, close to three with the screecher out. So we brought the screecher in, put the spinnaker out, and now we're at like five and a half, six knots. So picked up some speed, baby. You never finished telling us about your story. All right, so where did we leave off? You were reading a book, and you were reading books, and you noticed that the boat in the boatyard looked like it was I think you got there right or no and I went over to that boat and I asked what the deal is with this boat and they're like ah oh, yeah some guy kind of left it here years ago and we definitely just want to get rid of it so like you know make an offer and maybe you could have it so at the end of lifeguard season I finally had some money in my pocket and I went back to that boat yard and I said all right like what yeah you know, how much do you really need they were like just make an offer they're like if it doesn't go this month then they're gonna crush it and just get it out of there make space for other boats so I went back and I was like look I'll pay for you guys to put it in the water and take the mass down for me and I'll store the mass on the deck if you just kind of let me take it off your hands and they're like we'll put it in the water for you give us 800 bucks I was like all right deal I went to work as a teacher's aide that winter the whole time kind of worked on Tula on the weekends when it was warm enough and then especially as the spring and the next summer approached, I really started to put my time in and get Tula into the shape that she needed to be to sail. And by the end of the summer, I was getting really close. So I said, you know what? I gotta let this school know I'm not gonna come back. I have to do this thing. It's looking like I'm there. I'm able to get the boat launched at the end of the summer. I gave my notice of resignation. I think I still have that letter. We'll overlay literally a handwritten letter I like mailed in to, to the school. And at the end of lifeguard season, I think I had to jam for a couple more weeks to really get it done. And then I put it in the water that September. I didn't spend a ton of money because I didn't have a ton of money. I spent a lot of time. I redid a bunch of our decks. I got the engine started. Oh my God. 
So once I put her in the water, I sailed her any second I got, which was all the time. I sailed her in any condition possible. I tried to never use the engine, and that was kind of from me reading like Lynn and Larry Pardee's book where they didn't even have engines on their boat, and I thought that was the coolest thing. So I was like, you know what, I'm gonna try to sail this boat like I don't have an engine. And I'm so glad I did, because I learned so much doing that. I didn't really know what the goal was, I just knew I wanted to sail this boat south and get to warm weather, and I was looking at like the Bahamas, I didn't really know anything about the Bahamas, or at least Florida, or wherever I could make it. But I still need to learn a lot. Basically, once the boat was ready to sail, and I loaded her up with what I thought I needed for cruising, my mom helped me with some safety gear, she thought I should definitely have some of the safety and warm weather gear, and I'm glad she did. We um, still have all that stuff. I still have all that stuff, yeah. I left, I did a shakedown trip from Long Island, South Shore of Long Island, all the way out to Nantucket where my cousin was working at the time. I learned so much that trip. It was cold, it was rough, I broke the boom, I fixed the boom. It was in Nantucket through October. Yeah, and then I sailed her back to Long Island and I spent another couple weeks fixing some of the things on Tula. I, I knew that needed to be fixed. I learned on that trip, just getting re-prepared for my trip south. And then a week before Thanksgiving, I left Long Island and I s turned the bow south and I headed south. And again, not really knowing exactly where I was gonna stop, just knowing I wanted to get to that warm weather in a place where I could do water sports and just play in the water through the winter. Sailed down the coast solo. I did mostly just day hops, you know, from one inlet to another inlet rest at night and then another day hop had some rough experiences I, I learned that it was really it was okay to be away from any sort of civilization for like two days but after two days I got antsy and I needed to like go into town and just like go into a coffee shop and not necessarily talk to anyone just like be around people that was something interesting that I found out. By the time I got to probably around here, North Carolina, I was like really starting to run out of money. Actually, my mom gave me a loan for like two grand. I said, I just want to get, you know, a little bit more south and to a place where I can work and, and save up some more money. So she believed in me, she gave me a loan to keep on going. Still needed some more money than that. So I was trying to think of other ways I could make money. So I started, I would I had a bunch of beach glass on the boat and I would make like beach glass jewelry and I sold it, I like posted pictures of it on Instagram and people would like message me, just my friends and family mostly who thought it was cool and they'd like buy it for 10 or 20 bucks for like this beach glass necklace or something like that. By the time I got to Florida, I was just like, all right, that's it, I'm done for now. Let me just get to a cool town in Florida that's warm where I can work and save up money and kind of figure out what's next. So I got to like Melbourne, stopped in Melbourne. I was like, oh, maybe this place and then I was like, nah, I'll keep going so I kept going got to Stewart Manatee pocket the same thing cool little area but I was like I'll just keep going a little bit further south and then got to Jupiter and I thought the same thing I was like I don't really there's not any great anchorage over here maybe like this little cut off the ICW this little horseshoe canal where I saw another boat anchor maybe I could anchor in there but I was like no I'll just keep going so I kept going another couple miles down the ICW after a couple miles, my engine coupling just broke. I knew it was kind of on its last leg, but it just broke apart. And I was like, oh shoot, like that was probably a sign. Maybe I should go back to Jupiter. So I kind of, I really didn't have a choice. I kind of bandied it back together. I just used a couple bolts to put this coupling back together, limped my way back up to that last anchorage I saw. And that was it. I got off the boat, started walking around town, looking for jobs at and basically anywhere, restaurants or shops or coffee shops. I got a job at a kiteboard paddleboard shop where Sierra worked. We worked there for about a year and we were friends and then we started dating after that year. And that, my friends, is what you call fate. So Tula brought me to you and now yeah. we're married <laughs> 10 years later. <laughs> All right, we got to probably pull the spinnaker down in a bit here and then turn into this creek. We'll finish the story in a little, a little bit. Water. 
So let me just add, when I submitted that letter of resignation, first off, I knew it was just something I wanted to do to try. I didn't know if this was gonna be like a permanent lifestyle or even like a long-term thing at all. And I figured if it doesn't work out or if I don't like it, whatever, I'll, I'll you know, kind of come back to where I left off. And I figured that would be way easier than getting a solid career as a teacher and Again, we're on Long Island, it's a great job, not wanting to let that go to try out something else. So basically, Tula led me to the love of my life over here, introduced me and us to this whole lifestyle, living aboard and cruising and just seeing new places with our whole home by boat, which is unbelievable. I wouldn't trade it for the world. The rest of the story made short. Basically, Sierra and I started cruising on Tula together, kind of part-time. And then we determined that Tula wasn't quite big enough for two people and a puppy. She was only 26 feet long and a relatively narrow 20, 26 foot uh, boat. So we ended up selling Tula to an awesome guy named Tom. We had the next deal that came along, which was Neverland, our old 34 foot marine trader trawler. Tula allowed us to buy Neverland and then fixing up and cruising and living on Neverland allowed us to buy the next boat. and. So our YouTube channel grew from there as well. But basically Tula started the whole thing, the whole lifestyle, brought me to the love of my life and uh, started the business. And ever since we sold Tula, I really have missed her. I follow Tom on Instagram and Facebook and I see that he's been taking really good care of her. I think initially he had a problem with the engine or the shaft or something. And I don't know if it was his original plan anyway, but he was gonna, and he did take out the engine and put in an electric motor, just did a bunch of you know, modifications to the interior to make her a little more live, livable. He didn't live on her full time, I don't think, but he stayed on her, he did some trips on her, I think, and stayed on her and sailed her a whole bunch. So that's the story of Tula. <laughs> oh, Tula. I built this bowsprit from scratch. I think it's on mahogany if I remember it correctly. <laughs> I remember how we got that, I think. Did we do that one? I'm pretty sure you ran into a marker. <laughs> when I was going to the bathroom <laughs> in the Keys. I can't believe you <laughs> sailed all the way down in her. Spent many hours in this cockpit. Tula, it's been a while. All right. I like the wood. It looks so cool. You see that stove in there? Are you just in heaven? You've always wanted a wood stove. I know, stove. man. <laughs> wow, man. Oh, she looks so cute. This is crazy. You want me to read this? This is what uh, Tom, the owner, who's been taking care of her, who's owned her for the past eight, nine years, nine years, he wrote us a letter. Hi, Billy and Sierra. I hope you understand how happy I am that you two are taking Tula back. She's a great boat a beautiful sailing vessel and has seen me through weather I should not have been out in. I did want to detail the things I've modified on her, what's worked and what hasn't. So he talks about the electric engine, we'll read about that, electrical, rigging, and other. I hope you are able to use Tula and enjoy her as much as I have. Fair winds, Tom. That's what he was talking about. <sighs> Oh, he made her look so cute. So, go cool. look at this sign out here. Oh, look, that was from me. <laughs> Where did I get that? I think maybe my brother gave it to me or someone. I think it was my brother who gave it to me. Oh. Yeah, the chart wallpaper. Um, 
our table was like a folding thing right there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Where was it? Right here, right? Yeah. It, like, it was like pallet wood that yeah. I made and like folded down to there. It's so cozy. <laughs> Wow, look at that. That's so nice. I love these latches too, jeez. All right, you guys, this is insane. This is the boat that started the whole adventure. This is why our YouTube channel is named Tula's Endless Summer. This is what introduced me to this cruising, live aboard, free spirit lifestyle. And brought him to me, baby. Found me the love of my life. Yeah, this is, this is her, she looks awesome if you guys haven't guessed it already we're buying tula back we've always said that if tula was ever available again we'd want to buy her back and that's what happened she became available again after tom did one last trip in her and uh we're buying her so tom's last trip his last sailing trip from the chesapeake down to here was all to raise money for a nonprofit organization to benefit veterans, and Tom himself is in the Navy. So for what we bought Tula for, he that all went straight to this organization. Nothing went to Tom's pocket or anything. He just all the all the money went straight into this organization. We told him, and what we'd like to ask you guys for help with is to raise some more money raise some more money for this organization so i'm going to read this straight from tom's uh, fundraising page so his goal was to get to florida sail from virginia to florida so here he is he says i am sailing a thousand miles from virginia to florida to benefit the gary sinise foundation's mission to serve and honor our nation's heroes and their families i'm asking that you make a minimum do ten dollar donation for each 100 100 miles i complete this is a fundraising challenge to benefit the Gary Sinise Foundation and their work for veterans. I will be sailing my boat from Virginia to Florida, a distance of roughly a thousand nautical miles. I am asking people to donate $10 to the Gary Sinise Foundation for every port of call that I make, and I will donate $100 for every stop that I do not. In his frequently asked questions, why are you doing this? The Veterans Administration is inadequate to the needs of many veterans, and I do not see politicians of any variety lining up to help. Therefore, I feel like I personally need to do something. In my opinion, the Gary Sinise Foundation offers the best services and support to veterans for every dollar donated. Tom's already met his goal, even though he didn't make it. He had a lot of weather and um, some boat obstacles to contend with, so he made it to where we are now, not quite to Florida, but he still met his goal and exceeded his goal of raising $10,000 for this foundation. So at the end of the day, like we got Tula back and it was a good deal. That money did go to an awesome foundation, but we want to raise a little bit more money. And we know from a veteran, this is his foundation of choice. So it's going to a good cause and anything you guys can do to help would mean the world to us. So Tom gave us uh, a great opportunity and a great deal to buy Tula back and we just kind of want to pay him back how however we can which I think this is the best way is just to to ask you guys to support us in supporting him in supporting, supporting the vets <laughs> there's there's 216,000 of you guys out there so just can you imagine if everyone just put in a dollar, like how much good that would do. This foundation, they do a lot of work on building and modifying houses for veterans that are disabled and can't move around their homes properly. So, ooh, just knowing that we could, we could help make a big change in somebody's life. And as for the future of Tula, to be perfectly honest, like owning two boats is silly in most respects. It's not financially responsible. It's, we've just always said it, and this is the opportunity and we don't, want to let it go so that's why we're we're getting tula back eventually we want to kind of turn her into a little business to help you guys maybe do some sailing lessons or do some boat sailing, life or sailing mechanical coach. or yeah sailing coaching sailing demo demonstration something along those lines something where we could use Tula to help more people get out on the water somewhere in between there we'll probably do just a complete restore of Tula like you know kind of the way we did with Mountain Mist but even to just maybe another level a little bit about Tula of what Tom's done 
he took out her diesel engine, replaced it with electric, which is super cool. I, I like the idea of that. He did a ton of work on the interior. He has a whole list of what he did in the letter. So I think at some point in the future, we don't know when or where or how, but at some point in the future, we're going to do a complete restore. We were missing like restoration projects a little bit. So this kind of just came up at just about the right time. And yeah, like Billy said, we don't know when we can do it, but we just figured um, there's cheap, relatively cheap storage around here so we can store her until we have time to come fix her up and then probably bring her down to Florida and set some sort of something up at some point. <laughs> As you can tell, we're still unsure, but we got, our brains are moving and they've been moving for quite a few years about this opportunity, so. And within the next month, we'll have um, a little bit more time on Tula when we bring her to a boatyard. So let us know if there's anything specific you wanna see about Tula or like uh, just anything specific and we'll be able to show you guys at that time. For now. I, I, it makes me so, ooh, so frustrated that we um, didn't take as many videos back then as we do now. Like we have some little stuff, but not Bunch like pictures. full stories. And even a lot of our pictures, that was before we like saved everything. Like we took a lot on our old iPad that we use for navigation. We don't have that anymore. So we don't have those pictures, but I have them in my head. <laughs> we thank you guys for supporting us and for supporting this fundraiser. And we're so happy to see Tula again, be back on her. And so happy that she had someone so great on her for the past eight years, like... Taking care of her, improving her, and who was willing to let let us take her back over again. All right, well, for now, I'll see you guys later.